This is Frank Consella with the Crested Beat is Home podcast, and my guest this week is Pat O'Neill. And Pat O'Neill is a, a frequent competitor and oftentimes the winner of the Al Johnson Uphill Downhill Telemark race that takes place every year. And he has also competed in every Elk Mountain Grand Traverse race between Crested Butte and Aspen. He's also won that event. And uh, this year he will be doing uh, doing it as a fundraiser as well. So we talk about the charity that he's trying to support with that. So lots of good stuff to talk about with those two items. And he is also one of the incredible teachers at the Crested Butte Community School so we talk about uh, what it's been like to be a teacher in Crested Butte over the last 25 or so years. As always, visit CrestedButteIsHome.com, and you can follow the show there and receive every single episode for free right there at Crested Butte is Home. And let's go ahead and have a chat with Pat O'Neill. My guest today on Crested Butte is Home is Pat O'Neill. So, Pat, tell us uh, tell us where you're from and how you got to Crested Butte. Oh, boy. Um, I'm originally from northern New York. I grew up in a little town called Watertown, New York. And I uh, uh, had three older brothers, and my dad was a, he worked for New York Telephone Company for 40 years as a cable splicer. And he worked as a national patrolman in this little ski area called Dry Hill Ski Area. Dry Hill, that's not really a good name, Dry. <laughs> well, we got pummeled by by big snowstorms, actually, off Lake Ontario. Okay. And I went to a, uh, a SUNY college in New York State. And in 1986, at age 22, I came out to see a friend named Jim Kiefer from Old Forge, New York, uh, who was working up at Gothic at the Science Laboratory. And I came out here uh, November 1st, 1986, <laughs> and I've pretty much been in Crested Butte ever since then. So you'd already graduated college? Did you, had you, you didn't have a job at that point? You were just kind of cruising around, or what were you doing? I, uh, I was going to spend one year in, in Colorado and ski, and the first day I was here, I was offered a job at the Mount Crested Butte Grocery and Deli. Uh huh. Uh, I got a ski pass and uh, was gonna just stay here for one year, and then um, my plans changed. Yeah. Because there's no place I'd rather live than Crested Butte. Yeah. And um, so I went back in 1990, 91, and did a master's degree and did my student teaching in. At the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut, and then came back to Crested Butte in 91, and I said, I'll give it a year to see if I can get a teaching position here in Crested Butte. And on the 11th month, I got an interview <laughs> and got a position at the Crested Butte Community School, and that was 27 years ago. Wow. All right. All right. Well, let's just get into that. So... Uh, so you have 25 plus years now. So how did you decide on teaching? Was that always kind of something you thought you might do? Um, not really. Uh, I was dating this woman. She was pretty incredible. And I just went back East and I stumbled upon this program and, uh, where you could get, um, your master's degree and do your student teaching in a year's time. It was very intensive. And while I was doing my student teaching, I found out very quickly it's, it was something that I wanted to do. Okay. And, uh, but, you know, I, as I said, I was open to, if I didn't get a position here, going to Aspen or Steamboat or Durango and, uh, and trying to get a position there. But, again, on the 11th hour, I was, I was offered that spot. Offered to, to get to stay where you really wanted to be. Correct. Perfect. So, um and you teach English, right? Has that always been been what you taught at the school, or has For that changed? For the most part. I mean, I have a math background, and I started at the school. It was funny, Frank, and I was given a three-quarter position, which is, I don't really understand what a three-quarter position is <laughs> as a teacher. It's full on. And yeah. I started teaching seventh grade math, sixth grade English, eighth grade English, 
and seventh grade life skills. And at 27, I, I don't know why they gave me that position because I didn't have a lot of life skills. Life myself. skills. <laughs> um, so, but for the, for the last 25 years, I've been teaching seventh and eighth grade English. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, well, let's talk about, so yeah, the three quarter position. So that was probably when the class sizes were what, 15, 20 kids per year. It's, it's really funny you ask that because those years were pretty incredible for me. The early years of teaching, we were able to teach the entire middle school fit into the small building that is now the police station and KBUT radio. Mm-hmm. And I believe the average class size then was about 18. And, uh, you know, that's quite a difference, you know, saying 54 to 60 students were now in the middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th were looking at about 180 students. Yeah. So things have, things have uh, changed, but, you know, the school is a pretty incredible place. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, well, let's go ahead and talk about that. So, you know, it's always rated very highly and, and things like that with some yes. of the test scores and stuff. So why do you think that is? And I think I know the answer that it's all of the above, but maybe I'm wrong. So why, why is it such a good school? You know, it seems like on the marquee uh, out front, you know, when people drive into town, they're going to be able to see we won the John or Ir- John Irvin award or uh, U.S. News and World Report. I think there's a lot of different factors that make Crested Butte Community School amazing. I think the dedication of the staff. Yeah. I think um, the support of the administration for the for the um, teachers, but the students are remarkable kids who get to grow up here, and our parents are incredibly supportive of the school. Um, they pass pass bond issues when we need to pass a bond issue. Our attendance at uh, parent-teacher conferences is close to 100%. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's a real um, friendly kind of open-door policy, I think, between the teachers and the parents. So we feel like that we have everyone's support as teachers. And if you look nationally... That's not how most teachers feel. They don't feel supported by the town. They don't really feel supported by the parents, the administration, where we kind of have this perfect situation over there right now. Yeah, well, and it it helps when when the results are there, too. It's easy to be supported and respected when... When everything seems good, right? (laughs) It it is, and it's, it's, you know, and I think that the staff is really humble about the successes that we've had. But it is kind of nice when you get a family who comes from Houston or Dallas and say, we had our kid at a really incredible private school and he's getting a better education here than he was back in Dallas or Houston. I mean, that definitely, we feel okay when people say that. It's yeah. Okay, you know, so. Yeah. And my, my own children have gone to the system. I mean, I have twin daughters, Katie and Piper, who are just about 14 and they're in my eighth grade English class. And so I've been able to see you know, their progress from, from kindergarten all the way up to almost high school. So yeah, it's yeah. been neat. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, as you know, my wife um, worked at the school and oh, yeah. and she's, she obviously same, like you said, there would be private school kids and they're like, well, actually you're kind of behind. So we're, we're going to catch you up here, exactly. here at this public school. So oh, yeah. And Brittany was an amazing math teacher. Well, thank you. Um, so going back to, to English, so um, was that a, it wasn't really your favorite subject, or was it your favorite subject? You said it you was. Were it was. I mean, when in my undergraduate, I I had a degree in English. Okay. And then when I went and did my master's, my focus was in English. Okay. And writing literature, um, <clears throat> public speaking, and so all of my credentials are in. In English, although, you know, I mean, in the early days, Frank, you were asked to do anything. And I remember in my <laughs> job interview, I wanted the job so badly. <laughs> when I interview, there were a lot of really good people who interviewed. And I was, I pretty much said, I'll drive the bus, I'll coach soccer, <laughs> I'll teach math, I'll do this life skills, um, I'll work three quarter time. 
I'll work as a janitor. And they yeah. pretty much said, okay. Yeah. And so I ended up starting the soccer program over there. Our soccer program, you know, because of Than Acuff and Bob Carr, just won a state championship. That was yeah. huge. And in order to get in, um, I pretty much had to say, um, I'll take on any job that you guys have for me. And I guess that was a thing. There weren't that many jobs. Yeah. It was really hard to secure a position at the school. And I'm so glad because I didn't want to leave Crested Butte. And now the opportunity to raise my kids here is, um, it's like a dream. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I've heard that from, from other people that I've interviewed for sure. That, yeah. That's, that's a big part of, of being here. So, um, and that's, and that brings up a great point where, um, you know, if you want to live here, that's, that's kind of step one and then you do what it takes. And, and then eventually the job and those other things kind of fall into place, which is the opposite of how most people, you know, most people go for the job first and then they figure out the, the life, you know, <laughs> we're starting with the life and we go to the job. It's kind yeah. Of- it's amazing. I mean, it's, for a lot of us, we came to Crested Butte. We wanted to, you know, we wanted to ski. We wanted yeah. to mountain bike. We wanted to trail run. Um, you know, I always wanted a position where I knew that I could ski every day. So yeah. I worked at Le Bisquet in the restaurant. Sure. I did that and never expecting that I would have this incredible career at the school. And, um, but, you know, I think a lot of people will come to Crested Butte and just see what happens. And if you get somebody who's been here, like we have 20, 25, 30 plus years, I mean, it's hysterical, all the jobs <laughs> that we've had. Right, I right. Mean, and, you know, and you still have people working, you know, three to four different jobs right now. Of course. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was looking a little bit. Uh, so you know, English, we all remember those books that we had to read. Yeah. Do you change that up every year? Do you, or is it kind of, yeah. You know, for me, for me, I, I have to keep myself challenged and I have to take on different books. And, um, there's certain books that stay that I call must read. Yeah. Must reads. And, you know, whether you, that's the alchemist or whether that's, um, uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, Romeo and Juliet, The Outsiders. It's wild. The kids, you know, written in 1960, and they love it. And, it's a great movie, uh, too. What's that? It's a great movie, too. It's an amazing movie. And that was Francis Ford Coppola. And he found all of those those uh, those kids to play the main parts in that film. And they all pretty much became... Big stars. Big stars. Yeah. 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 Do you have a favorite then? Favorite book year in, year out? You know, I I have to say that for me, To Kill a Mockingbird, that was a Mm. book that really impacted me. I remember reading it in 1980 in 10th grade for Mrs. Remarino's English class. And at the beginning, I thought, where's this book going? And then I saw just the power of Harper Lee's incredible book Mm -hmm. and it still really resonates with the students in you know 2018 yeah so that's um, that's a sign right there if it can last that long and you'll like this because you like adventures and skiing all of the 14ers in the state of colorado with your wife is we're reading a book right now called The Long Walk by Slava Mirowitz. And it's You've read it. Yeah. Amazing. It's a great and, book. And I always want to say that, uh, you know, when you think you're having a bad day because you didn't get invited to the pizza <laughs> pool party, think of walking from Siberia to northern India. Because I really, in, in my education, I, I like to try to teach a lot of life lessons about perseverance and grit and setting some goals and... And not not giving up on something just because you have a few hurdles you have to go over. So that's been a really fun part of being a teacher in Crested Butte. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of opportunities to, to set goals around here, actually, too. I, th- I well. think so. <laughs> I think so. So, well, cool. Let's take a quick break. In the Crested Butte Real Estate Minute, 
In this episode, I wanted to talk about inventory, which continues to fall in the Crested Butte area. At the beginning of this year, 2019, we are down about 35% in terms of residential listings compared to a year ago in the beginning of 2018. So we still have a, an inventory problem here in Crested Butte, and that is not the case in areas like the Denver Front Range where inventory is finally starting to rise. So if you're a seller and you've been considering selling, I do think that now is a good time to consider doing so. You can find all of my market reports and sign up for my monthly newsletters at CrestyBeautysHome.com, which is the same as CrestyBeautyRealEstateAgent.com. And you can also find my contact information there. My name is Frank Consella, and let's get back to the podcast. So getting back to it, and we're going to change the subject a little bit. So cool. going from teaching, we're going to go into to all the skiing and other things you've done. So, <laughs> um, so well, let's just start with the Al Johnson. So first explain what the Al Johnson is for people who don't know. Holy smokes. Okay. I will tell you this. Um, it could have been around 1974. The guy who actually used to work for CBMR years and years ago, and he was his name was Rick Borkovic. And when he was going to school at Western State, <laughs> um, he had to do a research paper. And he researched this mailman who went between the town of Crested Butte and Marble and Crystal. And you might know this route. He, you know, through the punch bowl, he had to go up high on the punch bowl. And he did this paper. And I don't know if it was for... Dr. Dwayne Vandenbush, but it probably was. Sounds likely. And so when he read about Al Johnson and his brother Fred and the early days of, of skiing, like in the 1880s, 1890s, he kind of became obsessed with this, this crazy mailman who was running mail through this. I mean, you've been through the punch. Really before. gnarly. Yeah. You really know. <laughs> gnarly. And so he decided to have this uphill downhill race. And I believe, Frank, the first one that they did is over by where the West Wall lift is. It was kind of short. Oh. And then as it started to evolve, uh, before the North Face lift was put in, we would start pretty much where you get off Paradise lift and just cut right through to the notch into... Um, um, hard slap. Okay. And then what they decided, because they didn't really want people going across the lift, is they were going to do this telemark race because of the history of telemark skiing here in Crested Butte. And it's this, <laughs> this crazy race um, where it's about a fast climb would be about 11 minutes and then a fast descent would be about two minutes uh -huh. on this wambly telemark gear. Um, and then it changed with, I think he was the mayor at the time. Alan Bernholz wore a costume and I believe he came as Marge Simpson. And then it changed um, into a, a costume a huge, I mean, I, I don't even <laughs> remember that change. I, I, no, I, there, I <laughs> there was a change because before it was, I mean, really, really gunning for the win. And I think the U.S. Postal Service came in one year and the top prize was a thousand bucks. And so oh, wow. that was more than most of us were making <laughs> in a winner. And so um, people were really, really gunning for it. So I think I've done. 30, 31 of the 32 Al Johnson races and have managed to win, I think, eight. Nice. You know? And you win <laughs> a pair of skis, which I either keep or give to my friend Than. And uh, it's it's been a lot of fun. But I came I came here never thinking I was I was gonna do another race because I have a background in alpine ski racing. I think I did slalom and giant slalom from the age I was three mm -hmm. all the way until I was 15. And then it came, became really expensive for my family. Yeah. But I trained in Lake Placid and 
had connections with Northwood School up there, which started in 1974, and had a private, you know, a coach, Horst Weber, who's from Austria. And I never thought once that was done <laughs> that I would ever be in a ski race. Um, but I kind of, I think I caught a little bit of the bug to start doing events again. To compete um, again, yeah. Yeah, and that was, that was in March 1987, so. So what... Um... But the race is won on the uphill. So where, did you grow up as a cross-country racer too or anything, or a cross-country runner? Or, or? I've never been asked that. I mean, I, as a kid, I played lacrosse and I played soccer. I was one of those guys who liked to run. Uh-huh. And um, I remember doing these ridiculous uh, running drills and things in lacrosse and soccer back in Watertown. And, um, so yeah, it's one on the uphill. I mean, there's, there's been times where there's a couple, yeah, <laughs> there's a couple of times like Geo Bullock, you know, you have him by 30 seconds and he was able to pass you on the downhill. But, um, yeah, I guess I, I guess aerobically I've always been, that's been a, something I've been able to do. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, so that's a, you know, 15 ish minute event. So let's, Take that and let's go to the Grand Traverse. So oh, man. what's the Grand Traverse? Let's start with that. And oh, <laughs> okay. Um, riding my mountain bike over to Aspen. I was going to go up over, you know, the, the route. It's a really cool one. It's my favorite way to get there. It's to go up over Star and then up over Taylor and then Richmond Ridge to the sun deck of Aspen and then ride down Aspen Mountain. And so I'm riding up there, and this woman named Jan Rungi, when I was riding my bike, she was hiking, and she grabbed my handlebars. <laughs> and I was, you know, like, what are you doing? And she said, I have an idea. And she was with Brian Dale and Jerry Deverell. She said, what, what would you think if we did a ski race starting at midnight in the town of Crested Butte over at the school? And we came up past a hut and we went up over Star and then we dropped down, went up over Taylor, went Gold Hill, and then we took it all the way to the sun deck. And then we dropped into Aspen to be about 40 miles. And I said, that would be awesome. And then I rode away thinking that she would never bring it up ever again. Yeah. And so my good friend and partner for many years, Jimmy Faust who's still in the Valley. We got a call and this now was, I think January. And she said, I'd like you and Jimmy to go and ski the route. <laughs> the route. Okay. So we had these, I think we had Fabiano leather telemark boots and Carew XED comps, which we call death twigs and a three pin binding. Mm -hmm. And we loaded up and we really had no idea how it was going to go. So we, we pioneered the route and we told her, we basically <laughs> said, the first thing we said is don't do it. No, no. <laughs> because I mean, we, at the time we were doing a lot of skiing and we moved through the mountains pretty well together. Mm -hmm. And we said to Jan, okay, it's going to take the skiers and she, and she had thought, should we do it in teams of two? And I said, oh, absolutely. With the avalanche changer, you have to have a backcountry friend with you. And you're yeah. going to have to do all of the, the gear that we carry when we go out. And it's going to take anywhere between 10 hours and three days. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that was really exciting, Frank, in the sense that Jimmy and I got to initially go and 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 lay out the the race course. And were you doing that in like one push as if you were racing or were you We taking... did. Okay. The first time we did it, Jimmy we didn't really know like if the race was ever going to occur because a lot of people have had crazy ideas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, you know, and and um but Jan who had this she was a really neat woman and she had this vision and it quickly caught on. And 
what we found, Frank, is that it was mostly locals from Crested Butte and Aspen. And I guess, I think that the original thought was it wouldn't be a race as much as it'd be an event to bring these really two unique and cool um, mountain towns together. Because there's a lot of history between Aspen and Crested sure. Butte. I would see us as definitely sister towns rather than rivalries. And um, so the first one happened in 1998. And um, here I am signed up for Elk Mountain Grand Traverse 22. And I haven't missed one since the first one in 1998. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of the beginning of the event. Now the thing with it, where I think the first year didn't even fill up. I think there were, I don't know, I think the Forest Service gave us like 80 slots and there were like 60 teams. Okay. Now they do 200 teams and it usually fills up on December 1st when the registration opens. Yeah. So really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's also come into like a mountain biking event and a running event. And I know. And too, now but... they do this triple crown <laughs> yeah. and this, this, 23 year old, uh, maybe, you know, he would be a good person to interview. Um, <laughs> uh, his name is Cam Smith and he's 23. He went to Western and he, he's the triple crown champion. He yeah. almost went one first, first, first. He won the ski event. He won the running event, but then he got like a fifth in the biking event for a combined time. That was, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> he ran from Crested Butte to Aspen in under six hours. Yeah, that's just nuts. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> what is that? That's the mutant status, right? Frank? Right, right. So what? Uh, so you've and just to go back to the the ski event, and you know you've won what three times? Is that correct? Well, or, it, in one way or another? Yep, three three times, and then. I've been on teams, I think, podiumed like 11 times. So and what kind of times are we talking with some of those? Those are, those are seven and a half to eight hours. Eight and a half, you're starting to push into, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth. Okay. And then in the early days, they used to have a window, I think, where people could even come in. It started at midnight, obviously, you know that, where the snow is set up and there's less chance of um, spring avalanches and slides and danger. But I think they gave people like a 17-hour window. Uh-huh. And those people are coming in at like 6 o'clock the Just next the day, sun is coming, coming down, down yeah. Spar Gulch. Yeah. And those people are really inspiring to watch come down. Yeah, that's just perseverance right there for sure. Yeah. Do you train for this event like specifically, or do you just go skiing as much as you can? You know the best, <laughs> <laughs> you know, is Geo Bullock once said that Grand Traverse is just training for skiing corn in the spring. And I, <laughs> I've had different years, Frank, and Jimmy and I, we would just go and do big adventures and and go ski things like you do. We'd ski around here. Um, But certain years I train, and this year um, I've got a new partner. Um, It's really exciting. His name is Brian Smith, who's... A well-known fast guy. (laughs) Well, (laughs) How's that for I like interviewing with you. You're (laughs) fun. He's a well-known fast guy. (laughs) And we've never had an opportunity to ski it together. And Ryan has won four. And last year, um, I might have told you, but my oldest brother, um, Steve, was born in 1954 in Miami with a disease called cystic fibrosis. And I did a fundraiser last year with a former student, Jack Lenahan, and we raised sixteen thousand dollars for cystic fibrosis. That's awesome, and Frank. I have to tell you that raising that money and seeing the enthusiasm that people had um, um, was really moving. I um, bet a guy named Mike Haney thought um, 
there should be like 70 charity slot teams and you get to register early um, and you raise money for your chosen, whatever that is, yeah. adaptive cystic fibrosis, um, uh, people with autism and like that, that was really, really, really exciting. So I was looking around at um, charities within the Valley mm -hmm. that, um, th that I wanted to do uh, the Grand Traverse for, and I thought of six points yeah. for um, developmentally um, disabled people in the Valley who have different challenges. And Brian Smith has been the director of six points for two decades. And I was going to do it again with Jack, but Jack decided since he's an Aspen now that he would have an Aspen partner. Uh -huh. And I said, you know, Smith local fast guy said, you know, we've never done the race together. Would you want to team up and do, um, a charity team for six points? And he said, I'd love to. Awesome. So we've had this incredible response and in, I don't know, Frank, in 22 days, we've had 50 people help us raise $3,400. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll keep and, going hopefully. And, and yeah. I'll, and I'll put that in the show notes for sure. Um, for it. anyone listening, um, Love the GoFundMe that. site will, will be up there for, for people to, to donate if they'd like to. Um, so how do you decide who to race with then? All that, is that just every year is different? You've probably done you probably had a lot of partners over the years, right? You know, I have, and I've had these amazing partners. And I tell you, Frank, you can learn a lot about a person. <laughs> I bet. That's a... In eight and a half to nine hours when you're skiing through the night. Um, I always thought that I was just going to have Jimmy Faust. And mm -hmm. Jimmy had um, just some work done on his, um, his hips, mm -hmm. two hip resurfacing jobs. And he was... The greatest partner. I mean, he was a mutant <laughs> and I've done it with amazing people. I've done it with Jake Jones. I've done it with uh, an Olympian, um, Rebecca Dussault. And we ended up in the co-ed getting fourth overall. Um, that was amazing. That was really <laughs> neat. And uh, Jack Lenahan, a former student, which is awesome. Um, a guy named Marshall, Thompson, who works on patrol. He's married to Stevie Kramer, who's um, an amazing athlete, maybe the best trail runner in the world. And uh, it's just been really neat just getting to know these different, these different people over the, over the years. Yeah. And, uh, I've never had a bad race. And my friend Espresso Bob, we did it for a couple of years and you kind of just see where you are um, and just, you just pick a partner. Uh -huh. But this whole charity thing is, is really changes my focus. Adds a different dimension to oh, it. A, a, an amazing dimension. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the fact that next week I'm going to probably be skiing with um, special Olympics athletes with Brian. I don't think I've, I'm so excited to go and be, with the people that we're trying to help through yeah. the six points fundraiser. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, let's start to wrap it up a little bit with this, but, but let's hear at least a couple of good stories, whether it's the weather or something that you've experienced out on the grand verse. Of course. Oh, oh man. Pick, um, pick a favorite or two. <laughs> the, the grand traverse, um, you know, the amazing thing about the Grand Traverse is, Frank, <laughs> anything can happen out there. Yeah. And you you see the craziest things taking place. Um, I would say one year, Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy and, and, and I were, we were having a very, very good race. And we get to the stage top of star pass and people are like, all right, Jimmy and Pat, things are looking good. I think we're, I don't know if we're smelling the barn. I don't know if we're really, you know, thinking um, about the podium, but I think maybe a little. <laughs> uh -huh. And so 
I don't know if you've ever done this, you know, hopefully you've never done it where you or Brittany have been on a peak and like you're <laughs> the wind blows the ski off the peak, but Jimmy <laughs> gets to the top of star pass. Did you have, it's usually about three fifteen AM and you're, you know, you've been on star, mm-hmm. you're going to drop down. The wind is blowing and Jimmy, Jimmy's, uh, ski just just mysteriously uh, falls off and then he for some reason visualizes his ski running like 2000 feet mm-hmm. and he's like oh i saw it. i heard it so we go down as a team and we look all all over for the ski the the day you know, daylight is happening. Like we like to be pretty much at the sun deck when it's still kind of dark. Yeah. And we can't find the ski. And so we decide we're just going to go back to the top of star pass and we're just going to trade <laughs> skis where one person is going to be on one ski and then the other person will be on two skis. And we're going to, we're just going to do it in however many hours. So wait, hold on, just to recap. So you went back towards Crested Butte looking for the ski? Oh, well, we went down more towards like uh, Taylor Pass. like Taylor Okay, Res- so you were still going in the right direction, at least sort of. Kind of. Okay. And then we walk back up and Rich Smith is there and he's like, hey, did any of you guys lose a ski? <laughs> and the ski had been at the pass the entire time. Just one ski just sitting there. Just one ski sitting there. Oh, no. <laughs> and so we get we get the ski, uh, Frank, and we put it back on. And we are finally in this place in the pack where we're like, we're with the people. <laughs> and everyone has to say, what are you, what are guys, you guys doing, doing here? <laughs> and we, and we, we, Jimmy said, let's make this really, really fun. And he said... We're just skiing the Grand Traverse, and it was really amazing cheering people on. We were able to, like, stop, use our duct tape, and, like, help people put their poles back together. And this was, like, early generation, like, like cell phones and, like, uh-huh. and, they, and they all wanted, like, pictures of us, like, behind them. Uh- <laughs> so all these people were stopping and making us, like, pose in their photos. And you know what? We ended up, you know, finishing 11th because we said hi to people and then we started booking towards the finish. Mm -hmm. But that's the Grand Traverse in the sense that um, when I ski in a race, my goal is is now with a charity to try to raise awareness and money for, for organizations and to help people. Yeah. But it's really to thank every single volunteer out there. It's really to cheer people on. It's really to help people out. And um, I think I think that's one of the reasons that I like it so much is, you know, you never know what you're going to get. Uh-huh. I mean, it's you think you've got all of your stuff completely dialed in. Mm-hmm. And then between you and your partner, some some crazy event is going to take place. And yeah. So it's, it's, it's a great event. It's a really, really great event. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to kind of bring it back around somehow if I can. So you talked about goals with your students and things like that, trying to get them to see that. So, you know, have you had, I guess, try to explain maybe some of your students that you've now seen grow up and maybe take on challenges and take on goals or, or for instance, do the Grand Traverse with you, like you just mentioned. So any good stories with with some of your former students and watching them grow up and be adults? It's You probably have too many, but... (laughs) You know, I mean, I I really have. I mean, I have... My current students are... The seventh graders are 12. But um, like Jackson Petito, I just spoke with, who's now an attorney in town, and... Yeah. <laughs> Probably the next mayor of this town. He's he's close to 40. Yeah. And I've watched these kids go out and um, the students I've taught do incredible things. And um, I've seen many of them return to the valley and also do incredible things. And, I mean, there's no doubt about it that 
I mean, we have, when I take the kids to the sand dunes in the eighth grade trip, we have a, you know, who can get to the top of the dunes first. And here at 54, I'm still, you know, <laughs> I'm still trying to just, you know, uh, respectfully bury, <laughs> you know, these students on this climb, but you know, they're starting to, you know, it's starting to pick me up, but you know, Travis Schieffer, I've seen when the Grand Traverse and now he's an architect and I've right. seen, um, I was beaten last year, um, by this kid who won a Betcher scholarship where he's going to, uh, um, uh, uh, CC, uh, Colorado College, um, and uh, Benjamin Swift, you know, who won a Betcher scholarship and beat me in the uh, uh, Al Johnson. And, I, and, and I'm the happiest person in the room when that happens. Yeah. Because you want to see kids like Woody Martineau, who just got accepted uh, – to Williams and he's skiing on the, the Nordic program, but he's also this incredible academic. And these kids who I've got to see become these Nordic stars and Emma Coburn. Hello. <laughs> I mean, you don't think that we don't take huge pride in Emma Coburn and Aaron Blunk and, and, and David Chudowski and all of these Olympians that we've turned out, but we also, celebrate when girls that I've taught or people I've taught are hospice nurses or mm -hmm. they have children or they work um, at a rehab facility. And I mean, Frank, I have taught so many students this time of year in Crested Butte, the holidays, like many of them are back. Yeah. That's and gotta be I fun. just, I just like to just sit and listen to them tell me, how fortunate they felt being able to grow up in this town. Uh -huh. And they didn't really see it when they were 13 and 14. Yeah. But when they come back, they just know that this is a really a community still based on helping people out when they have a hard time and having yeah. a fundraiser for a person who is struggling or doing something for living journeys or Crested Butte still has that, um, that soulfulness where people can stop and take the time and, and help other people out. You know? Yeah. You know, my 91 year old neighbor, Paul Redden, he grew up in this Valley and the only time he left was when he was in the service from 1946 to 1950 and seeing him get up in the morning <laughs> and walk with his walker towards the gas cafe. I mean, just to see that and then see the kindergartners, you know, riding their bikes over to the Crested Butte Community School. It's a, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's you know, Crested Butte isn't a isn't a bad place. Yeah, I think yeah. that's why you and I have chosen to live here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that and that's we're starting to wrap it up. But that's that's one of the questions I always ask. Crested Butte is home for you, and it sounds like you mostly just answered that as is this community in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. And it's amazing because I met my wife and she's a New Yorker. She's from Rochester up in Watertown. And, you know, here we are raising our kids here. And, uh, you know, we, I, I always tell folks, I say, you know, it's, I'm, I'm 54. So, you know, I've been 27 years at the school. That's more than half of my life. And, you know, I've, just picked up my 33rd ski pass. So I really call Colorado my home now. Yeah. And I still have loyalties to New York and, and New York state, but you know, this is, you know, maybe at 91, I'll be walking over the Butte Avenue bridge. <laughs> I don't know if they still have a, you know, a Burley or a Shirley or a Hurley, but you know, <laughs> they, they probably might, will. You know, they so. probably will. They probably will. Uh, anything else I should have asked? No, I really enjoyed um, being interviewed by you. It would be just as easy for me to to interview you. Um, that's but, <laughs> that's coming. One of these days, Brittany's going to interview me. You know, that's really cool. And, it, and uh, it's, it, it's interesting to be interviewed because it really makes you think about what we do here. And, right. Uh, that's what I'm going for. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really... It's, it's really um, 
It's a really nice format you've created here. So well, thanks. Thanks. Well, I'll just uh, reiterate that uh, check the show notes for the um, fundraiser for six points. And then last question, who else should I interview? Well, I was thinking about this and I am absolutely fascinated by Jim Deli Schmidt, who's the current mayor of Crestview, mm-hmm. because if you talk about a person who's dedicated himself to this town and tries to hear from all sides of an issue, Jim Deli Schmidt blows me away. Uh-huh. In, a, in a room full of people, he wants every person to be heard before making a decision on the on the direction of town. So Yeah, no, that would be really good. Yeah. And it's in like, you know, the back of the paper, they've got the twenty years ago. Yeah. And, and there he is as a as is, a town. Is he the mayor? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I, I don't remember if he was mayor or, or council, but but either way, you know, he's quoted quoted there and yeah. It's and he's so humble. I mean I mean one of the things in this valley is I don't know if I think it comes the longer you live here. I think humility is something that, I don't know, living up here in these, at 9,000 feet and, you know, going out and doing the stuff we do, it really, I think this town really allows us to become right size with time. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Well, thanks so much. It's been really fun. Thank you so much.